kid. Seriously. <laughs> Welcome to a triumphant return of the Star Wars in Review podcast, the only Mustafar podcast with a charred black exterior and gooey, fiery middle. That's how I like my marshmallows. Over there, it's Luke. You heard I'm Luke Neitzel. He's the only person I know who bought himself a wrestling belt to award his video game exploits. Over here, it's Maya Madrid, who would never, ever get over intense about a video game ever. Every so often we get together to discuss the news in the realm of Star Wars, answer some of the questions you sent us, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, and whatever you do, don't tell your mothers you're hanging out with us. Luke Neitzel. How much more fun was doing that video game wrestling league when there was a belt to fight for? It was so awesome. It It was was very awesome. And the the one match where I lost it was heartbreaking and nerve-wracking, and then I got it back. Who beat you? Uh, our buddy Maynard beat me. Was it Maynard? And it was a weird. It was a weird thing. It totally was not on the level because I was pummeling him. He hit me with one move, and then my guy just never kicked out. Like I lost in like thirty seconds, and he did one move to me. So it was it was horrible. Luckily, I had uh, an automatic rematch that I got to to call in, and I I won that that puppy back. You call it uh, horrible. I call it justice. That was my favorite moment of that entire uh, entire league. In fairness, of the. 30 or so video games that all of us in college played together, that was the only one where I wasn't a complete and total embarrassment. That's so you true. have to give me my one game I could actually compete in. But I liked you when you were a complete and utter embarrassment. That was my favorite part about you in those leagues. It was something watching <laughs> me run my one football play. It's great. How you doing otherwise, man? Good, good. I, uh, I coached the first week of my son's soccer league. They didn't have a coach, so I had to step in last minute. We, uh, we put in a good effort in our 12 to nothing loss. Uh, but it, it was a good time. It's a nice day. They run around. They're little kids, so they had fun. They didn't care. They got they got Oreos at the end, so it was all worth it. Excellent. Uh, for me, Avengers saw that last night. I know that you saw it. I'm obviously not going to get into spoilers. We're a Star Wars show, but real quick, just my thoughts. I didn't get the theme until the last 15 minutes, and only then did I really start to enjoy the movie. I did enjoy the story arcs of, of some of the major characters, but I felt it was suffocated by the need to have everyone have their time. I wish it would have been billed as a story with one or two of the Avengers and with Thanos and use everybody else's cameos. Um, there was so much CGI on the set pieces. I thought the CGI of Thanos was, was really good, but it's, it's kind of like Guardians of the Galaxy without the colors. And I didn't care for a lot of the dialogue and some of the jokes felt a little forced and many of the twists I saw coming. So. I, I loved it. I thought it was fun. That is the the best villain we've had in any of the Marvel true. movies. He is extremely well done. I was fascinated by him. At, at points, almost sympathetic to him even. So I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was a good kind of culmination to these 19 other movies. It is very, very long, though, so I don't know how rewatchable it will be. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I think I might wa- watch it again just to see if I like it better. I don't know if that'll be in the theaters or wait till video, but I suppose we'll Well, we know you'll buy it. Oh, of course. <laughs> I'll buy it immediately on the day it comes out. <laughs> That's what I do. Uh, let's talk about Star Wars. Let's get to the news. Luke, our internet lives are built around Star Wars animation, and we have been feverishly looking forward to news about what Disney might have in store for that upcoming streaming project they're doing. Based on the success of Clone Wars and Rebels, its successor, we've been hoping that Dave Filoni would be heavily involved. Well, we got our answer. This is from Star Wars, the Star Wars website, StarWars.com. This fall, welcome the Resistance. StarWars.com is thrilled to announce that production has begun on Star Wars Resistance, an excited new animated adventure series about Kazuto Shiono. And that's, people are pronouncing that all different ways. I, I believe it's pronounced Shiono. But anyways, a young pilot recruited by the Resistance and tasked with a top secret mission to spy on the growing threat of the First Order. It will premiere this fall on Disney Channel in the U.S. and thereafter on Disney XD and around the world. Featuring the high-flying adventure that audiences of all ages have come to expect from Star Wars, Star Wars Resistance, set in the time prior to the Star Wars Force Awakens movie, will feature the beloved droid BB-8 alongside ace pilots, colorful new characters, and appearances by fan favorites including Poe Dameron and Captain Phasma, voiced by actors Oscar Isaac and Gwendolyn Christie, respectively. Luke, a couple different things here. It's got pilots, spies, and Gwendolyn Christie. Let's talk about the Resistance and discuss the reasons you may or may not be underwhelmed. What are your thoughts? 
Oh, I think it's great. I think it's fabulous. It's a time period that hasn't been explored. So we get to see what happened between a very large gap in two movies. So there's a lot of territory for them to go off and explore and do new things that we haven't really touched upon other than a few of the novelizations that have come out. So I think this is a great place. I don't think there is much more gaps to fill in the other the other kind of saga storylines that we really need to delve into more. So this is a good place to go. It sounds like it could be a little similar to Rebels. So let's see how they do it. You know, if it's kind of a, a group of four or five on their own, you know, navigating a, a big baddie organization or, you know, force that could get a little repetitive, but I think there's a lot of avenues they can go. It's nice to know that some of the voice actors are going to be some of the stars that are actually in the movie, which makes it exciting. I know we have a little bit of that in Clone Wars as well, which is cool. So no, I'm very optimistic and open-minded about this. I, I haven't seen all of Rebels. I've seen a good portion of Clone Wars and we're obviously revisiting it now. And I think Dave Filoni does good work more often than he does bad work. So I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt before he really lets me down and makes an all Jar Jar series. Well, I think for number one, and most importantly, this is more material for us, and that's what really matters at mm-hmm. the end of the day. So we can keep on keeping on. Um, it happens at a time that I'm excited to learn more about. It's one of my critiques of The Force Awakens. We just feel like we were th- kind of thrust 30 years later. Don't really understand why we got there or why we were there or what was happening. I want. I really wanted like a Luke Skywalker, Han, and Leia post-Endor series. That's what I would have been looking for. But this feels like the next best, best thing to me. Um, one thing I thought was interesting, it, it says Disney and Disney XD. I had assumed that this was coming out on streaming, on the streaming only service. Is that a little weird to you? Well, when does the streaming only service launch? I'm not really sure, to be honest. Yeah, I'm not really sure uh, when it starts off. I guess I'd have to go back and look at that. I just figured that it would coincide. Maybe this is coming early. Maybe there's another one. I thought there were maybe two shows. I know there's a live action one with John Favreau. Um, but this kind of took me off guard a little bit. I wasn't expecting it. Well, you know, I don't think they're going to pull out of their cable channels. So you do have to provide premium content for both services. And if you have Star Wars fans that are going to consume everything, this is a good way to make them buy two things as opposed to getting it all on one. And Disney is never going to turn down dollars. There's another advantage that I think you're not hitting. Um, It also gives people who want to consume everything the ability to not read which is very important, especially in our country. Especially for me. Hey, in a recent interview with Alden Ehrenreich, Esquire.com talked to the young Han Solo about all things. They also reached out to the previous directors to get more information on why the young actor was cast. The article quotes Phil Lord as saying, The outlaw thing is an act. We wanted someone who presented as a pirate but also had a big heart underneath. Lord tells via email, An impression of Harrison Ford would have felt like an extended Saturday Night Live sketch, Miller adds. We wanted someone who could evoke the spirit of the iconic performance we all remember while bringing something new and fresh. We talked a little bit about how Chris Pine, playing Captain Kirk, didn't do a Shatner voice and brought his own spin to the character while still evoking the vibe of the character. We felt Alden did the same with Han Solo. For those of you interested in learning more, check out the interview on Esquire.com. But before you do that, let's ask Luke how it feels to be so spot on about the Chris Pine thing from last week. Well, it feels fabulous. I'm such a smart, intuitive pop culture that person. That is how you present yourself. Yeah, well, well I mean, I think, I think what I said wasn't particularly unique. Um, I, I think a lot of people would have come to that same conclusion, uh, that that's... You know, I, I don't know anyone, and I don't particularly love those Star Trek movies like most people do, oh, but I, I think Chris Pine is by far the best part, and I haven't seen anyone who has told me they don't like him in that role. Maybe William Shatner would, because it's not him. but <laughs> Or because he's not in the movie, right? Exactly. But other than that, I, he is by far the best part of that. It's a, it's a great model of how to build that type of character when you're re- recasting someone who might be considered iconic in that role. So hopefully uh, Alden can pull it off. As I said before, I've seen him in one thing, which was Hail Caesar, and I thought he was great in it. So hopefully he can do this. And... Hopefully it's just a fun time. I'm gonna, we, we've talked about it a lot, but I'm going to go into this with no expectations. And if it's enjoyable and light and fun, then that's great. And if it's not, then, oh, well, I'll move on. Uh, much like uh, 
much like Dickens, I have great expectations for this movie. And I'm happy that this move is as blatant as it is. And I'm surprised that it's as blatant as it is. It seemed that when they cast uh, Lord Miller, the directors were thinking a lot of what the rest of the, the people were thinking. That we wanted to make sure that it was his Han Solo. And that it wasn't something, you know, something else, or like a like a, co- a carbon copy, or an attempt at a carbon copy. And I've really enjoyed the trailers. I think they got it right, and this makes me even more excited because it wasn't just something that was kind of in the back of their minds. It was something that was in the foreground of their minds, and that gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Only a month to go. That's right. I was actually, to be honest with you, I'm more excited for this movie than I was for Avengers: Infinity War. Oh, really? I've gotten to that part, that point, which. Um, which is, says which, a lot about me. I it mean, does because normally you, I believe, you would say that you like the Marvel Cinematic Universe more than Star Wars. Right. Yeah. So right. yeah, that is that is surprising. So hopefully it pays off for you. I'm all in, buddy. I'm all in on this nice. one. I need this one. Just like the Justice League. That's, all in. Oh wait, wait, buddy. Oh, God. did you really bring that up? Hey, I saw it. You're a bad person. Had a good time. Hey, let's talk about questions that, uh, or sorry, emails that kids seriously got. Question from the cheap seats, and it's directed at me, and you'll like it. Uh, because it rips on me pretty good. Nice. It says, so, if Maya thinks that Luke, quote, is at his best when he's not fighting and embracing the Buddha aspects of being a Jedi... Which, you, which sh- you said last which week. Which I have said. You said that last yep. week on the show, that right. that's how you like him better when we were talking about fighting. And scenes. I said that before in things uh-huh. that have been cut out by you. Oh, I uh, know where this is going! Yes. So, you hold on. You're not going to interrupt me. Not this time, all right? Um, this should love The Last Jedi as it's Luke's Luke at his most Buddhist. So here's what I said. So here's what he, how he finishes. So which is it? Luke's an or Luke's awesome as a Buddhist, or he isn't. Here's what I say. First, I want to say that my thoughts on the Last Jedi have always been at the mercy of Luke Neitzel's editing. Let's walk through how the Last Jedi conversations tend to go. We listen to Luke talk for about ten minutes, reiterating the same points, discussing character development without really getting into specifics of what it means in the context of the story. I wait patiently and listen to him without interrupting. I'm allowed about 30 seconds to rebut, and I begin to go line by line to get my point, points out, at which point he begins interrupting me. His voice goes up a handful of decibels because loud means he's right, and he physically starts trembling like a 12-year-old on a first date. We get to editing, and he realizes it's trash and comes to the conclusion that we can't use it because it's garbage. That's happened a handful of times. Now, let's answer the cheap seats question directly. Well, hold on. I just want to talk about editing for a minute. Okay. Because I do edit the show. And we can debate whether you think my editing choices are sound or not. I have been censored like no man. Okay. But it's amazing that I never get praise when you forget whole sections of the show. Like, say we're supposed to... Hey, we're not talking about that right we're now. Supposed we're to, not talking about that right now. We're supposed to rank Wes Anderson movies for a segment. And, and I then, may have forgot. And I you go into forgotten. the close, and then Luke goes back, tells you what you need to do, and then seamlessly edits it in. We never get the compliment side on that. But please, continue. I just feel like a man shackled by, by censorship. Um, the Last Jedi. Uh, so, let's answer the cheap seats question directly. You don't understand my views because I haven't been able to ever get them out and discuss them without fully being Ann Coulter'd or censored. So let me break it down for you. Luke Skywalker is a great at the end of Last Jedi. It is my second favorite representation of him. In the beginning of the movie, he is garbage. You can like parts of a movie and not like others. I like parts of this movie. I just don't like it as a whole. I feel it was sloppy storytelling with characters whose stories are half-baked and a poor representation of characters that did not respect development that happened in the stories before it and relied heavily on a two-minute flashback sequence and sea cow juice. It was dumb, and I like it less each time. Just like Attack of the Clones, there's a great scene at the end, but it doesn't make it a good movie. Those are my feelings about The Last Jedi. I hope I've been clear. You have anything in response? You're just gonna sit there and about what? Anything? No, I don't no. care if you like it. <laughs> it's completely fine with me. All right, I hope that answered the question. That's uh, <laughs> see, now, this is the one time, the one last shot I think you're not gonna say anything just to try to prove me wrong. I like it. What? Well, well, okay, no, let's let's pull out all the minutia of the Last Jedi okay. and go through it and yada yada. Do we want to do that no, or just points? No. no, I'm good if we move on. Okay. Like what you like. All right. Hey, you at home or on the road or in a car or at the bar, what are you up to right now? Why don't you send an email to kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com and ask us a question so we can read it on the show. If you're listening via YouTube, give that subscribe button a smash. Help us now. Take it up to 12. Well, 12. I actually wanted to mention this. Okay. Because 
this is big, and we got to use the Spinal Tap reference, which is my favorite comedy of all time. About... I know, I'm thinking of unsubscribing, so we can go, to... <laughs> go back to 11. <laughs> yeah, but not only is that cool, because we achieved our, our goal of 11, which we set out for, though I'm a little sad we can't say the Spinal Tap thing, what I'm most excited about is I know exactly who the 11th subscriber was. Can you say it? Is it Jim? It's Jim! No! Not Jim! Oh! So thank you, Jim! You no. made it 11! Hey, how did he like Avengers Infinity War? He liked it, but we saw it, and we both had to leave immediately after, so we didn't get to talk about it much. I'm sure you've talked about him since then. He didn't, he didn't no, he's it. out of town, so I'm waiting for him to get back. How are you doing with that? I'll try to hang out. It's rough, but I get through. I have a little picture of him that I put by my bed, so I feel safe at night but when I go to sleep. in your bed? Either in one. In your bed? Well, it depends. When I'm ready to go to sleep, I put it back on the nightstand. Let's talk about Clone Wars. All right. Uh, season 1, Episode 13, Jedi Crash. Greed and fear of loss are the roots that lead to the tree of evil. Written by George Lucas's daughter, Katie Lucas, with the return of Rob Coleman in the director's chair, this episode analyzes what it means to be attached and what it means to take a side as a group of Jedi find trouble and are marooned on the planet Meriden. Luke, let's have it. All right, so we open on this one, and we are in a new storyline, so the opening narration is setting us up for what we're doing, and basically we are in the Quell system, which is again in the Outer Rim, where all of the show has basically existed to this point, and it is a massive space battle. The Separatists are completely overwhelming the Republic, so they are downing their cruisers left and right, and we have one cruiser left that has a, a newer Jedi. Have we seen her before? Ayala Secura? Ayala Secura. Um, I'm not sure offhand if we've seen her. She looks Maybe very similar right. to uh, Ahsoka's partner when they fought... Oh, man, I'm blanking on names horribly. When they, they fought Asajj, Ventress, no, there was a Jedi, and they have a similar, similar character right. design, but they are different. Uh, Ayla is the same race as the dancing slave girl from right, Jabba's Palace. Like so the, she's on her Star Destroyer, or I suppose at this time they're Republic Battle Cruisers. Uh, one thing I want to say before we get too into it, this is really interesting to check out because it's something that we haven't seen in Star Wars. This battle actually takes place in the atmosphere, um, which we've seen more since The Force Awakens, but it looks like Earth. It's basically like a white and a blue, and it's really bright, and that's that's a stark difference from that deep black background of space or some of the other ones that we've seen. And I really thought, and as we'll talk more, the visuals of this episode were amazing. I thought Rob Coleman did a fantastic job. Um, I thought it was really, really striking, and this is when I first noticed it right away. Was there too much blaster fire? Sure. You guys know if you've been listening to this, show that i have a problem with that uh but it was really just beautiful it was beautifully done and i really enjoyed that space battle i actually have written down in my notes uh to talk about the color palettes that they use in here because they are really bright and they contrast each other and you're right this space battle is awesome because it's happening in atmosphere with blue sky and these cruisers are going down and then anakin arrives in the system on another battle cruiser and when they flip to him it's that dark black of space because he hasn't quite made it into atmosphere yet so they do a really good job, and there's some color schemes they use later in the episode that are really bright and, and very cool to look at. So you're 100% in agreement with you on, on that. So Anakin arrives to help bail this ship out, and what the, the clones or the droids do is they send over super battle droids to basically get onto the ship. And they're kind of taking the ship apart from the inside. We have a, a little bit of a fight that breaks out in there. Anakin gets on that ship, and they basically have to escape in a little in a little ship that's trying to to move out of the move them out of the system one thing i want to talk about real quick about anakin um he leaps from like uh the, the ship onto like a battle droid from way up high i mean we have no idea what the actual like land if there is any on this planet and he just like leaps out and lands on this uh on this battle droid and it it started to strike me as jedi superman and, and I think one of the things that, that I'm solidifying in my own opinion is that I like it when Jedi are more, I'm sorry, are less powered. Like, I like Jedi to be, you know, not Superman. And, I, and that's what I th thought of when he's jumping out and just barely being, and doing all this stuff, which is cool and cool to see it. But I sometimes think that that's a little OP. But I like it. I like it in how they do it in the movies because they have some superpowers in the movies that they do kind of come and go. 
in Phantom Menace, they have super speed in the opening scene and they never use it again. But I do think if you look at the movies, they're, they're very overpowered in the prequels, mm -hmm. which is when the Jedi are at the height of their powers. They have whole schools. They go through all this full training and they can do all these incredible things. And then they can't really do any of that. You know, Luke can't do a lot of that stuff in the original trilogy and Obi-Wan can't, but it makes sense because they're not being formally trained. It's just kind of... Well, Obi-Wan would have been formally trained. Yeah, but Obi-Wan's very old at that stage, so who knows if he can still do all that He's stuff. He's 53. The actual character... Well, Alec Guinness looks about 83 <laughs> in that movie. <laughs> enough, so enough. that's that's what I'm basing it off of. But sure. it, it works okay for me. They es end up escaping on a ship. So it's Ahsoka, Ayala, which I'll probably pronounce eight different ways during this episode. It's and, one of his charms. It is. Luke Knight's all this, one of his quirks. Anakin and a few different droids... They manage to escape, but Anakin is gravely wounded while they're going. So he's kind of unconscious in a coma, and they are trying to escape. Their autopilot gets busted, and they are going to crash into a star. Now, I take exception with the idea that he's gravely wounded, and this is one of the things. Earlier in this episode, I talked about how I would have liked a Luke, Han, and Leia um, post-Endor er, uh, series. One of the issues with that is that whenever one of the characters that we know makes it has this, you know, something major happen to them, the stakes are incredibly low. We know that he's going to be fine. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that makes me a little bit more excited for Star Wars Resistance and these new characters and why I think, you know, Star Wars Rebels probably caught on so well. is because we don't know um, who makes it and who doesn't. We don't see this new character from Star Wars Resistance um, in the movies yet. And so we don't know if they make it. And I think that's... You know, I, I'm talking against myself here, which is not the first time that I've done this on the show. Um, but in wanting something like that, where we have characters that we know their histories and their futures, this is a drawback of that. I mean, it is. I, you know, he's not going to die, but I think the situation they're in is interesting enough with where they go for it, go with it, and it it makes sense in the context of the story. Like, yeah, I mean, no one is sitting there going, "Oh my gosh, I wonder if he dies," but he is unconscious. Um, and on life support in their ship as they are trying to speed away, their Nava computer gets busted and is basically sending him into uh, the sending the ship into a star. So they have to deactivate all power on the system to override the navigation. And there is they try to create a little tension with oh we're gonna have to take him off life support in order to do this, which obviously we know isn't going anywhere. But they do it and then they're able to turn the power back on. So Anakin is still alive, obviously. And the ship isn't going to hit the star, but now it is going to crash into a planet. Did you like this crash sequence? I did. I thought it was amazing. Yeah. Like I was, the tension and the way that Coleman and Lucas, Katie Lucas, uh, build it, I thought it was one of the best moments uh, so far that we've seen this season. Exactly. And they, they land on that planet. They kind of come out. It's, again, a very desolate planet. There are, initially, because this was something I did notice, there are three clones and three Jedi, including Rex as one of the clones. And Anakin is in a coma, and then they kind of set up a tent, and they realize that they need to go find help, or he's not going to make it. So they decide to send everyone but Rex, and Ahsoka is very against that. She thinks she should be with her master, protecting him, doing everything she can with. This is kind of what they're going with with the opening scrawl, even though the opening scrawl fits about as cleanly as most of the opening scrawls do, where they don't really. But she has a lot of attachment issues. And she doesn't want to leave him. And they convince her to leave. And she has a line in there that I'm not going to say word for word, but I'm going to paraphrase, that I absolutely loved because it's one of my favorite things in this show is when they call the Jedi out on their bullshit yeah. and their hypocrisy. Oh my God, I hate the Jedi after this episode. Exactly. And what Ahsoka says is it, doesn't, it, it really doesn't make any sense. We're told we have to be compassionate, but we're not allowed to be attached to anything. And how is that possible? And is this like the daughter, Katie Lucas, calling out her dad? I mean, I, I shouldn't put too much. I should just give her credit for being a writer. But throughout this whole episode, I'm like, I felt like she clearly learned so much in some way from him as far as great storytelling. And But there are moments there where she's like kind of calling out the Jedi on their bullshit. And he, and he does, too, throughout the prequels. Um, but it was kind of, it shocked me a little bit. Yeah, I mean, my initial thought is that maybe it leads to the fact that maybe he was intentionally trying to show a decadent, hypocritical Jedi in the prequels. Now, I don't know that for a fact, uh, but I think it's very easy to interpret him that way. And the fact that his daughter seems to have interpreted him that way as well uh, is interesting. And, and I hope that was his intention as well. But they, they convince Ahsoka she needs to go off because they need more help. 
This planet has a giant tree, and they find some wood art that looks very tribal. That basically shows like a monster attacking, someone fighting the monster, and then they're under a big tree. So they decide they're going to try and find this giant tree, which they end up going off and doing. And they get to the tree, and there's nothing really there, but the tree drops these giant pods. And they realize someone's been pulling these pods off. Meanwhile, Anakin kind of comes out of his coma for a little bit and sees in the woods this... The best way I can describe it is an eagle lion? Like, it has the body of a lion, but it has the head and the talons of an eagle? It can't fly, but it look, that's what it looks like. Mm-hmm. So that thing kind of attacks, and him and Rex have to fight it, and then he goes back into his coma. They also get assaulted by them as well, the other Jedi out there. We also end up getting an extra clone all of a sudden. Hey, they're important. <laughs> and I don't know. It's important to have them. They got like a little vat in the back of the ship. Yeah, they start with they start with three total clones, and then they end up with four somehow. He was taking a crap, dude. Um, apparently, the whole time. So, well, good for him. That's probably what I'd say I was doing the whole time while I was cowering in fear. But <laughs> they get attacked as well, and it kills two of the clones. So now they're down to two Jedi and one clone. From these eagle lions, but they manage to make their way to a village that has these small uh, lemur-like people that are actually called lermen. So that's why I'm assuming they, that right. they're lemurs. Because I kind of was like, is that a monkey? Or is that a lemur? And then I saw their name and went, oh, okay, they're lemurs. So they live in the pods. They've been hauling them away and been using them to make homes, and they are immediately resistant to the Jedi because. They see the Jedi as a threat. They are pacifists, and they talk about how they left this their planet to come here where they could be safe from the war. And the Jedi say, well, no, we're peacekeepers. And they're like, no. They Yes, they snap that down immediately and say, you caused this war just as much as the other side, and you kill as many people as the other side. So you're just as responsible, which is a, a fun moral question that after suffering through Jar Jar bullshit last week, I really wasn't expecting to come out of this episode. So I really enjoyed that, and they they don't want the Jedi there at all. They want them out, and Ahsoka appeals to them saying, if we don't get medical help, my friend is going to die, and they aren't willing to let someone die. So unfortunately for them, they only have one healer in the whole place. It's a bummer. They need to train another one. A bad plan. He is the son of the leader, and his name is Wag2, so he agrees to go with and help, and they kind of say, well, you know, one of the Jedi can stay here, and the... Wag 2 will go with this other Jedi and the other clone to go get him and bring him back. The pods also have some healing power. So they go through. There's a little more battle with the Lion Eagles. And they bring Anakin back and and start to heal him up. And as we leave them in the village, they're still stuck on that planet. They still need someone to rescue them. There's no immediate danger. The, The Separatists haven't followed them down. But they're kind of stuck with these pacifists who don't want them there. And that is where we fade to credits. But this was a breath of fresh air episode for me. It dealed with a real theme about the overall moral, moral, you know, moral fiber of this war and what the Jedi are doing, how they perceive themselves and how other people perceive themselves. The action was good. I'm not a big fan of the character design on the Lion Eagles, but that's fine. They, they aren't terrible. They just aren't great. The... Color scheme, as we mentioned earlier, is fantastic. From that initial battle down to the the bright yellow fire um, of the star and crash landing on this planet, this was an enjoyable episode. It went really fast. It could kind of be its own episode, but I'm assuming it's going to be part of a two-parter at least. So I'm really, really happy with this, and we continue the trends of high and low. It's really bad episodes and really good episodes. Right, I love this episode. I care most about themes. I care most about characters developing i love visuals and i love music and with the exception of the music i thought the music was a little sort of spot on uh, maybe a little too much on the nose um but with the exception of that i thought this was a phenomenal episode i'm a little disappointed that katie lucas isn't writing the follow-up to this one and rob coleman i don't believe i have to check my notes but um i don't believe he's directing the next episode either and so that makes me a little bit wary i would i would prefer both of them to come back I highly, highly like this episode. I think it's one of the best. Well, hopefully they put them on a, the right course, because I, I think they have a pretty good storyline laid out. So even if they aren't writing the individual dialogue, and this is another thing I thought, is that I thought this episode had better dialogue yeah. than we normally get in these movies from, from all the characters. And this is where I'm also really seeing a push from Ahsoka into being just a great character. She is... 
similar to Anakin in the movies in ways that she questions things and isn't bought into everything they do, but she does it from a realistic perspective that's thoughtful, that's still kind of young and naive, but is also retrospective of, of the bigger picture, where Anakin's just a whiny brat in the movies. So I'm, I'm really liking what they're doing with her. I'm glad we're getting a lot more focus on her in this episode. Because I think this is where we're starting to see her shine and, and knowing a little bit about Rebels and kind of where she goes throughout Clone Wars and, and what happens beyond. people's attachment to her. Like people yeah. love her. People love her. People love Ashley Eckstein, the voice actress for her. There, There is a movement out there to get her her own movie. Oh, I would kill for and, her. And, it's, and I'm starting to see it. And people say, well, wait until the second season. I'm starting to see it in the first season. Yeah. And I, I think this may be one of the great Star Wars characters. Yeah, and no, she, she... We're getting to see a slow burn of her changing, which is right up my alley. I'm loving it. She She's a massive bright spot, and I think she encompasses everything that I want out of this series with a new character. So now that we're finally getting the payoff of what I kind of knew was coming, I'm really, really excited. So I, I'm hoping we don't get a drop-off into nonsense episodes after we get through this arc. I hope she stays a, a main focus, because... Most of the really great episodes are ones where she is heavily, heavily involved. And I thought back while I was watching this to the Clone Wars movie, the animated movie, which is terrible. It's awful. And she's terrible in it. She is. She's a bad character. Every, everything about that is pretty forgettable. So to think about what she started out as to where we are in 13 episodes. Half a season. Half a season. Is already spectacular. Yeah. And to know it's just going to build is great. So... This is, this is an episode that if someone came to me and said, oh, I'm going to start season one of the Clone Wars, this might be an episode where I say, watch this one first to get a taste of what the series can be. It's not my favorite episode, but you get the, the big battle sequences in space. You get a smaller character story down on the, the planet's surface. You get some new worlds. You get a lot of stuff that kind of encompass what this show can achieve when it's firing on all cylinders. I'm a really, really big fan of this. I still still have to put a couple other ones ahead of it, but this is definitely a four-pew episode for me. Laura Dern would give it at least four pews. I am wondering what Katie Lucas is doing right now for a living and why she isn't involved more in Star Wars. I don't know how many episodes that she does, but I will be looking for her. I think she... And I don't know, I don't want to take anything from her, I don't want to give her father credit, but it, you take a look at what George Lucas does and how he builds a story and all the great things that he does, she's got that in this episode. This felt like a Star Wars movie, it felt like the middle um, story in a Star Wars movie, where it kind of, you know, like, like Empire Strikes Back, how it kind of zeroes in on the character story and becomes a very, very small film in the middle um, it, it felt like the middle of Empire Strikes Back is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, and I... I, I hope she writes more of this series. I'm going to look into it. I'm going to be excited for every every uh, story that she writes. And I hope she does a lot in Rebels. And I hope she does a lot in Star Wars Resistance. And if not, then I want to appeal to people at Disney to hire her. Because who, whatever she's doing, this was a great episode. It's number two for me. The only thing I want to say is um, I just need a moment to giggle. Because you use the term, I'm not sure what she's doing for a living. Nothing. <laughs> she's, she's doing being nothing George Lucas's that she daughter. doesn't want right, to do right 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 that's a fair point yeah she's waiting to inherit two billion dollars or whatever well most of that's given out I thought he gave half of, whatever Is it, right. she does not need to work no she, she doesn't and, to, but, but I want to say we want I, more of her I forgot to add that okay so there's that's all that story building that George Lucas does really well but if you match that with good dialogue that was what George Lucas really struggled with. And that's yeah. what she does this. So the idea of that combined into one makes me super excited. Well, and that's 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 ninety percent of the reason to me why Empire is the the best movie, because you had Irving Kirshner directing, and you have who was independent of Lucas, unlike Richard Marquand, and you had Carrie Fisher redoing basically all the dialogue to make it real people's I thought, it was, I thought it was his wife that did that. Am I wrong? She did the editing on A New Hope, which everyone says saved A New Hope. His wife. Carrie Fisher did a ton of script doctor work. Uh, I remember when she passed away, seeing on Twitter, they released a lot of her handwritten notes that she did over the script. 
changing what the dialogue was to what it actually is in the movie. And that that was her role in Hollywood for a, most of her life was being a script doctor. I had no idea. Yeah, because she's an, just an amazing writer. So to see someone take Lucas's concepts, his broad concepts, and turn them into better writing and better direction is is how it should work and how we could have gotten, you know, probably three, six perfect movies if it would have gone that direction because he is he's good at technology he's good at concepts he's good at the yeah the broad strokes and i think the broad Not strokes with the actors. prequels are great it, but you're right it's it's actors and dialogue that he struggled with i put him in the same category as uh james cameron who come up with concepts and come up with special effects but get away from the dialogue and get away from the character development and uh stephen king who you know you you come up with really great concepts but man you are bad at connecting the dots on those concepts uh, and, and lucas is in that that same vein for me so uh, it's pretty cool to see another family member be able to do it so well maybe she got got some of that from her mom who like you mentioned is a renowned editor and a lot of people credit her with saving a new hope that it was a completely different movie with the lucas edit that no one liked and then she went in and redid it in it was that her mom or was she adopted after that breakup i i, I confess i, don't I really have no know. idea okay to be honest but yeah, right. great episode. It was fantastic. I, I would recommend it to anybody. I think you're right. I think this is the middle point here, and people have said, you know, it starts getting good in the middle, and if there are more episodes like this, I'm going to have a really good time. Let's talk about some other nerd news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Luke, what's got you going this week? I mentioned last week I bought a new TV, which I'm really excited about. And so I went out and I bought on Blu-ray because I've been asking for this. My, my in-laws and my brother and my mom and all those people, they always may have me make a Christmas list. And it always has like, I don't know, five or six things on it in total. And then they always, all of them always buy me something that's not on my Christmas list, which, which is fine. I, I, I don't care, whatever. But the one thing I have, have consistently had on there for like six years is the Universal Monster Classic Blu-ray package. So it has it has eight movies, and I went out and just bought it on my own finally because I wanted to to watch it on my new new TV. So so far I've watched I just got it this week, but I've watched The Mummy, I've watched Frankenstein, I've watched The Invisible Man, and tonight I'm going to do Bride of Frankenstein and The Wolfman. I've seen most of these movies from when I was a little kid, and I just adore them. They're so much fun. They're classic cinema. It's really impressive. The Invisible Man is a completely special effects driven in 19 it's either 32 or 33 so to see what they're able to do in 32 or 33 is so much fun creature of the black lagoon is in there which is one of the four movies my brother and i would watch constantly growing up so i'm excited to get back into that they're just they're really fun and they're also all about 100 or about uh an hour and 10 minutes so they just fly by as well so that that's what i've been into lately they are really fun if you haven't seen them go go read them they're a good time and to watch those and then to watch the tom cruise mummy and dracula untold it's like this universe isn't that simple to figure out you should be able to make this work and they've just made such garbage of it afterwards that maybe i need to give more credit to the the staying power and what they accomplished in these classic movies because no one's going to remember the tom cruise mummy in five years but you know you'll know the the uh, Boris Karloff mummy will be around for forever. I have a real. I, I haven't seen almost all those movies, but I did see Frankenstein. And I saw Frankenstein in a really expensive hotel in Los Angeles when I was eight. Nice. And um, right after we watched that movie, we went to go see uh, my two favorite teams, the Chicago Cubs and the Los Angeles Dodgers, at Dodger Stadium. And it wasn't on my birthday, but it was a celebration of my golden birthday. And so I love that Frankenstein movie. Um, I loved going to that game. It's my favorite stadium and my two favorite teams. And it was the first sort of time that my dad and my stepmom like took me out after getting custody of me and did something like, you know, like really big. It was like a, it was, I mean, it was just a really big Maya weekend. And it's something that I look back at and one of, one of the, my happiest memories from my childhood. That's, that's awesome. And it's fun when you have movies that you connect to like that, even if the movie itself I would stand behind any of these movies, but sometimes you have a movie that, you know, if anyone saw it in any other context, they wouldn't think much of, but because of the circumstances where you saw it, it's awesome. So it's, it's cool to have something like that. The one thing I was surprised about seeing these movies too, is how violent they are. Shockingly violent. You know, in Frankenstein, 
I don't think they they kill a, a lot of people. I think it's maybe two people, but one of them is a little girl that they he picks up and he tosses into the water and he doesn't really understand what he's doing. But not only is that shocking to see, there is then a long extended period where it is the dad carrying her dead body through the village while all the townspeople are having a party are watching him walk through and they kind of the as they move through each section of the party they just stop and stare at him as he's carrying this lifeless girl it's really shocking and not what you expect when you pick up a movie from that long ago and the invisible man kills over almost 130 people in that movie now 100 of them are in a train that he derails but he kills everyone on there and type of thing so it's it, it shocked me a little because i haven't seen most of these in a really long time and some i hadn't seen at all about how violent they really were back then. So it, it's interesting, and I, I recommend them to everyone. They are they are classics for a reason. It's awesome. Uh, for me, big news this week, the Golden State Killer, East uh, Area Rapist, original Night Stalker. That is a case that you and I have followed. It's a case that you turned me on to, um, to, to researching. It is one of the most terrifying things that I have ever thought about. Um, just some of the stuff from this case was just just horrific to the victims and the taunting and the um, just continual stalking of this guy and what he put the victims through um, both during his attacks and after um, was just horrifying. It's one of the three unsolved mysteries I really get into. It's this, the Somerton man and the Isdal woman. And now that he's been captured, it's been a huge sense of satisfaction and I hope the victims and their families get some respite and relief um, out of his capture. But it's just, you know, it's one of the big three for me. And it got solved this week. And um, it's just it's just awesome that they caught him. And I know it's better late than, than never, obviously. But, um, you know, it's it's so awesome. And there's a podcast on the the Is Old Woman that just started. Yes. What, two, two episodes? Two episodes out right. so far. So a lot of great content. That's a BBC podcast. And what, Death in Ice Valley? Yep. So it's called. So I'm sure you've listened to it. Yeah. You, I, I, you turned. I, yeah. You turned me on to it. Right. So I I went and checked out and listened to the first two episodes as well. So go go check that out as and, well. And the king is probably the Somerton man. It's about a, a guy who uh, was found dead on a beach and in Australia. In Australia. In. Um, it's also an awesome one. If you what, find any was, information, was he murdered? Was he a spy? Is it a romantic quest? Is it all of those things? That is a, a fascinating case, and you can find tons of information and about that online. If they found a, just a little taste, they found a rolled up uh, piece of uh, paper, like a cut out piece of paper that said, Tom, I'm should, which means it is finished. Yeah, so something something crazy. All right, that's what we have time for today. You can reach us at Kids Seriously, because that's where they're ca- what we're called. But uh, Luke, if they just want to talk to you, which is a likelihood... How do they do it? I am at Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L. And for me, at Maya Madrid, I hope you enjoyed this episode and hope you are enjoying some better weather we are here. Um, if nothing else, we'll see you next week. Exactly, and this episode might be confusing because I'm going to edit out a lot of what Jeremiah said about Thank the Thank you Jedi. so much for editing all of the stuff about Last Jedi and all the times that I mess up. Bye. <laughs>